This was originally supposed to be a movie reaction video, but after my Battle of the Super Sons reaction video got blocked a month after being approved, YouTube has tied my hands on the matter. Before we start, I need to explain how I only ended up seeing Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse for the first time only now in 2020. Dude, the year 2018 was one of my busiest years as my third year in college or university depending on who you ask, during which I also was working on two jobs. Granted, one of them was just for the summer, but the other one was on the weekends, during the nights where I was working as a doorman on three to four separate bars and restaurants. And if you have worked on a stressful night watchman job that also affects your sleeping schedule, while also trying to study for your third post high school degree, I would expect you to also remember nothing else but studying and working from that year. Like, I don't even remember buying any of the games that came out that year, and I only found Spyro Reignited Trilogy completed on PlayStation 4 when I got interested to try play it on 2019. And the 2018 God of War game was 75% completed, without any idea how I got that far, or what I was supposed to do in going forward in it. So naturally, I also ended up becoming blinded to what movies came out in 2018, and only later realized that this movie that everyone online was hyping up were on the contrary not hyping it up, and were instead talking about how great it was. Unfortunately, since I was still busy graduating in 2019, I kept pushing back on watching the film further and further, until it was four years later. And since I now have a YouTube channel and a small audience, I originally thought I'd share my reaction into watching the movie for the first time. But then the whole issue with the Sopersas movie happened, and I decided not to waste too many hours editing something that big only to get it blocked. So instead, I decided to make something that has already been proven to work, aka do an actual review that I hopefully got finished and posted by Into the spider Verse's original release date's anniversary of December 14th. And, in a four-year-old movie's case, I probably don't even need to give a spoiler alert anymore. Alright, let's do this one last time. Alright, people, let's do this one last time. Okay, let's do this one last time, yeah? My name is Gwen Stacy. My name is Peter Parker. My name is Penny Parker. My name is Peter Parker. I was bitten by a radioactive, radioactive spider. Pig. So, the movie is set in a version of the Ultimate Marvel Universe, because the Ultimate Spider-Man also lasted about a decade before Brian Michael Bendis created Miles Morales to take the Ultimate Peter Parker's place at that world Spider-Man. Up until 2015, Secret Wars happened, and now Miles is downgraded into being another surplus character with spider powers coexisting with the mainstream Spider-Man in the 616 universe. But anyway, that is the main setting of the film, with Miles Morales being the main character which requires the first 30 minutes to explain who he is, a high schooler, where he lives in, a private high school dorm in Brooklyn, who the people in his life are, his parents and his uncle, and how he ends up becoming the new Ultimate Marvel Universe Spider-Man. Yeah, the first 30 minutes are very miles heavy, and the fact that it takes so long for the plot to start pedaling can turn some people off from watching it, as a social experiment I did with my friends proved. Anteeksi jätkä, että mä valehtelin teille, ettenkö olisi oikeasti nähnyt tätä leffaa. Mä halusin vaan katsoa se uudelleen ajan kanssa, koska te olette mun ainoat kaverit oikeassa elämässä. Anyway, no matter how long that 30 minutes is, it still manages to somewhat organically weave the series of events from when we meet Miles to how he ends up getting bitten by a glitching spider. There are some plot holes or rather some factors that don't make sense, but I'll get to them eventually. Before the bite, Miles' parents, aka Officer Jeff and Nurse Rio, and his estranged school uncle Aaron are presented and established well enough that you can see them as what Miles has to protect with his secret identity. After the spider bite then has happened, there is a montage of, on one hand, creative, and on the other hand, somewhat cringy shenanigans on how the spider powers are activating on Miles. Then Miles retraces his steps to where he was bitten and stumbles onto the Ultimate Spider-Man's final stand against the Kingpin and Green Goblin, who are working on a super collider that will cause the rest of the movie to happen. This is more in line how the movie is set in a version of the Ultimate Marvel Universe, 
rather in the Ultimate Marvel Universe, because Goblin and Kingpin are not exactly the same as there. They are different and so not the same. Green Goblin, for example, resembles the alternate Goblin from the Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon, and he has wings and is more rapid, while the Ultimate Kingpin would never have killed Spider-Man as he owns the intellectual rights to Spider-Man and makes money from his merchandise, which is somehow subverted into Spider-Man owning them himself, while still having a secret identity, and J. Jonah Jameson does not exist to say anything about that. But since this is a Sony movie and Sony only has the movie rights of Spider-Man and his supporting characters, this movie cannot show the other Marvel heroes like Daredevil, Luke Cage, Jessica Jones, Iron Fist, Doctor Strange, Moon Knight, or everyone else who also lives in New York. And also because of that, the personal grudge that Kingpin usually has in the comics with Daredevil is transferred to Spider-Man instead. Meaning that when Kingpin has Spider-Man at his mercy, he of course does what he has the chance to do. But before that happens, the reason why this movie is called Into the Spider-Verse happens when Spider-Man is in the middle of the Super Collider that the Kingpin was trying to use to do the exact same thing that one of the witch was trying to do in the in Multiverse of Madness movie. By being in the middle of it, different versions of Spider-Man are pulled into this adaptation of the Ultimate Marvel Universe. Before he dies, the Ultimate Spider-Man is able to see Miles, recognize that he also has powers like him, and then gives him a flash drive meant to be used to shut down Kingpin's Super Collider. But Miles unfortunately ends up breaking it when trying out his spider agility in a low quality suit he got from Stan Lee in his final Marvel movie cameo by falling on it. And then we get to the other world's versions of Spider-Man, the first one of them being an adaptation of the mainstream 616 version of Spider-Man. Because comparing the life story recap of this other Spider-Man has to the mainstream 616 Spider-Man's life from the beginning to the One More Day and the current Amazing Spider-Man comics, Whoa. This Spider-Man is clearly supposed to represent the mainstream Spider-Man and how Marvel has been treating him. Miles and this other, aka the 616 Spider-Man, are then working together to rebuild the flash drive the dead Spider-Man had made, because by not being native to this universe, the 616 Spider-Man reacts to being there pretty much like how the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles did when they crossed over into Batman's world. That means that the 616 Spider-Man has to be sent home as soon as possible, and that leads them to a remote Alchemax site which is owned by the Kingpin. And speaking of Alchemax, one of those plot holes I mentioned earlier is related to the spider that bit Miles, but I have a feeling that it might have been created by Alchemax based on how it was glitching. There probably would have been some plot threads to tie the two together, but, but I have a feeling they were probably cut out from the final film. Also, here in the Alchemax site, we come across an another instance of how this is not the ultimate Marvel universe, but rather an adaptation of it. And that instance proving that is how the native version of Dr. Octopus is a gender-bent version of Otto Octavius. Also, I'm sure that this scene has spawned its fair share of Rule 34 recreations or fanfiction rewrites. Anyway, fleeing from the female Doc Ock with her desktop, Miles and the 616 Spider-Man run into the movie's other plot hole, aka Spider-Gwen. I call her a plot hole because we saw her existing and interacting with Miles long before he was bitten by the glitching spider, or before the now-dead Spider-Man swung into the middle of the Super Collider and pulled the other versions of Spider-Man into this world. Even her life story recap tells her story seemingly out of order by showing that she was pulled into her world because of the collider blowing up, but then tries to justify her previous appearances by making it seem that she arrived before the collider blew up. And even if the movie tries to have it be that Spider-Gwen arrived before the collider blew up, why did she go and infiltrate a private high school instead of going to find the native Spider-Man when he was still alive? Because her spidey sense told her to do that? That sounds like another example of 
the story moves the characters instead of the characters moving the story? Or was it done because this movie needed Miles to have a crush on a girl to have his uncle Aaron teach him how to talk to girls and that girl had to be tied to the plot? They could have had instead have it be some random girl who could tell Miles no and then have us move on from that setup. Regardless, the three now have the intel to rebuild the flash drive to shut down Kingpin Super Collider. And the best idea how to recreate the flash drive as how the Ultimate Spider-Man had done it, then sends them to look for the resources at May Parker's residence. I would assume that since the Ultimate Spider-Man was said to have been on the job for the last 10 years, the 616 Spider-Man likely remembers still living with his aunt at this point, so they naturally go to her. And this reunion with the counterparts of their deceased loved ones is done much better than in the comic book that Bendis did, where the 616 Spider-Man crossed over into the Ultimate Marvel Universe, in a more minimalist way. Which is then followed up with a high-tech garden shed leading into an underground bunker that I assume was paid to be built by having Ultimate Spider-Man use his intellectual rights to sell out on everything shown in the beginning. And the fact that he was able to do that also is probably why J. Jonah Jameson does not exist in this movie. Anyway, down there we are then introduced to three more alternate versions of Spider-Man, one of which I talked briefly about in a previous video I made earlier this year. This other one, whom I thought had been introduced into the comics right before the movie came out but was wrong, and the comedy relief character. At this point, I also have to acknowledge that as an animated movie, this film is able to do these cutaway recaps, story montages with these other versions of Spider-Man that are introduced here, and make them feel very organic to have in it. Because I have a feeling that they would feel very out of place in a live action movie. But now that we have the 616 Spider-Man, Spider-Gwen, Spider-Man Noir, Benny Parker and Spider-Pig, the movie begins to remind the audience that Miles is the main protagonist of this movie, and he has to grow into becoming like these other versions of Spider-Man. Seeing how he is the youngest among them, experience-wise, the other Spider-People tell Miles to go home and let the professionals handle the situation with the Kingpin's Collider. The 616 Spider-Man tries to put up a good word for Miles in telling how successfully they got the female Doc Ock's desktop from Alchemax, and how Miles can also turn himself invisible. Sorry, that's something I glossed over when talking about it and also something else that I'll get to later. Miles unfortunately does not have the full control of these upgraded abilities, and so he is sent home for being underqualified. As we now return to the movie being about Miles, he decides to go to his cool uncle Aaron, who is then revealed to be one of the henchmen working for the Kingpin. Miles' uncle Aaron is a supervillain called the Prowler, who is really well complimented in the animation of this movie, by the way. Especially when it comes to his movements and the way how his cape flows as he runs. If this was a live action movie, these shots which look amazing in animation would just be CGI of which quality would depend on the budget and who the director is. What I'm trying to say is, some movies that are made into live action should have always been animated films to preserve their visuals and not to compromise them with CGI. I was also somewhat confused with Uncle Aaron as Prowler in this movie, as I have played the Miles Morales PlayStation 4 by last 5 game, and I so knew about his villain identity. But because earlier in the movie, after Kingpin had killed the Ultimate Spider-Man, and Miles ran away from that place, the Prowler chased after him, and I thought that while trying to catch him, the Prowler would have noticed that he was chasing after his nephew. But this situation where Miles goes to his apartment and has to hide from his uncle as he enters in his Prowler costume, flees and is dragged down back to the Parker residence, I was clearly wrong about that. Maybe the tunnel was too dark, or that mask Aaron wears obscures his vision into not being able to see who he is trying to hunt down, or even recognize his own nephew from body language. The Prowler from the PS4 game was able to do that. At the Parker residence, Miles ends up leading all the villains there by the time when the Spider-People have managed to recreate the new flash drive. 
and the fight sequence that followed is another example why this movie could never have worked in live action, because being animated manages to also incorporate different animation styles, like in Penny Parker's clearly anime-inspired visuals, and the fact that this film also acknowledges in showing that it is a comic book movie. And here is the point where I was proven wrong that Uncle Aaron should have known about Miles, because when unmasking him and seeing that it's his own nephew whom he earlier taught how to talk to girls, Uncle Aaron starts to hesitate what he is doing, and Kingpin sees this as cause for termination. Literally. And so Uncle Aaron dies from being shot and is taken by Miles to die in an alley, where his body is then discovered by his brother, aka by Officer Jeff. Officer Jeff would have found his own son here as Spider-Man 2 if it wasn't for Miles' camouflaging ability, which then causes the man to unknowingly put an APB on his own son. And then as Miles retreats to his high school dorm, where the other Spider-People follow him to make sure he's okay, there is this funny scene with his roommate whose dialogue was cut because the MCU made Ned Lee and a carbon copy of him, and the filmmakers didn't want to point out that Gang Lee is the original character. Also, the 616 Spider-Man's body has been somewhat inconsistent for this latter half of the movie, where he was first established to have a, I'm not sure, a dad bod or a beer belly, and now that we're closing in on the third act climax, he looks more lean bodied than how he was shown before. Anyway, the 616 Spider-Man gives Miles one more chance to show him and the others that he can use his powers to prove that he could come with them, because they need one of them to be left behind into this world to switch off the collider after they have jumped back into their home universes. But in failure, Miles is left webbed into a chair to make sure he won't follow them, with the 616 Spider-Man choosing to die here. And then Officer Jeff knocks onto Miles' door, wanting to talk to his son after having lost his brother, but Miles can't open the door or respond to his father's emotional pleas or to respond to him because he's webbed and gagged the chair. And I'm just going to let my reaction to this scene speak for itself. Miles is your dad. Oh shit. Please open the door. Miles, I can see your shadow. Oh. Yeah, okay. The misunderstanding is still ignore me. Look, can we talk for a minute? Something um, Yeah. Something happened. Yeah, this is Look, sometimes people drift apart much. I understand. I understand. This Then I don't want that to happen to us, okay? Look, I know I don't always do what you need me to do or say what you need me to say, but I'm no, 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 snow cap. That's just. I see this, this spark in you. It, it's amazing. It's why I push you. But... <laughs> this is the only way how I can express how this scene is done. And how I see this scene be having been written. Look, call me when you can. Okay? I love you. You don't have to say it. Right? Oh. There are no words. I have no words to express myself. I just I just need to keep clapping. This is done so unbelievably well. <laughs> I understand so many people now. I so understand everything I have seen online and people talking about this movie. This scene was so, one of the best things in here. The setup that we got before it and how it's done now. Okay, man up, man up, man up, man up. And then Miles' own emotions here cause his Venom powers, to poor name by the way, to activate and release him from the chair. What then follows is a montage of Miles returning to the Parker residence where Aunt May is waiting for him and lets Miles redo one of the many Spider-Man costumes into his very own red and black costume. 
He does the leap of confidence he failed to do earlier in the movie, and after quickly getting the hang of it, follows the others to an event that King Ping is having as Wilson Fisk, and the 616 Spider-Man is able to see and discreetly speak to the local version of Mary Jane Watson, what he believes could be his final words to his ex-wife. Not to surprise anyone, King Ping's event party is a cover for trying to turn on the Super Collider again, and the spider people glitching out know that this is their one chance to get back their home alive. The 616 Spider-Man is willing to stay behind now that he got a chance to speak to a version of his wife, but then to no one's surprise, the villains ambush them inside the collider, and during this colorful spectacle that would have been done with CGI in live action, Miles arrives to back them up. I'm not going to pad the video longer by describing the fight scene too much, so I'll just cut to the point where Penny Parker loses the use of her Spider-Robot before most of the villains are defeated and all the Spider-People give their solemn goodbyes to Miles the 616 Spider-Man send-off is delayed a bit because of King being thrown at Tantrum, and the 616 Spider-Man first heads to deal with him before Miles stops him and tells him to go home and fix his life instead of looking for a good death here. The 616 Spider-Man hears what Miles tells him, and has faith in Miles being ready to be Spider-Man in his own world now, as he allows himself to fall into the singularity of the Collider. And then Miles defeats King Ping by combining his Venom powers, again, poor name, with the technique his uncle Aaron taught him as his father sees it happen and is able to arrest the King Ping. In the end, Miles then takes his place as the ultimate Spider-Man of his own life story recap, and the 616 Spider-Man goes to do something that the Marvel editorial is never going to allow him to do or get to have. The post credit scenes and shows Spider-Man 2099 running into the 1960s cartoon Spider-Man, and I think I'm done talking about the story recap now. Okay, the first thing I see this movie doing is justify the change I did in my rewrite of the 2018 Spider-Man game in making it so that the game's version of Miles was never bitten by any spider, and the playable version of him in his own game is like the one in this movie. Because Miles was initially created as a replacement as successor character, following the death of the ultimate Spider-Man, and this movie was able to be faithful to that established characterization by keeping him in his own world as its main Spider-Man. And THE 616 Peter Parker Spider-Man, who has been given shit and not been allowed to grow up in the main Marvel comics, was told by Miles to go grow up and move on past the one more day phase of his life. Something that we all know the Marvel editorial is never going to allow to happen. To make the point of this movie also clearer, Miles was made to shine in the end by letting go of Peter Parker and letting him stand on his own as the Spider-Man of his own world. And Marvel Comics should do the same by letting Miles be the Spider-Man of his own original world instead of by making him play second fiddle to Peter Parker in the 616 universe, while watching Peter suffer and not being allowed to move on in his life. Seeing how I spoke mostly about those things and kept complimenting the animation during the plot synopsis, I should probably also say something about the cast too. The Ultimate and the 616 versions of Spider-Man were voiced by Chris Pine and Jake Johnson, who gave pretty good performances in differentiating the point of their life from their characters were from, while Miles as the main character of the film was voiced by Shamake Moore, an unknown actor to me, and compared to Pine and Johnson, which made Moore's performance as Miles feel authentic and fresh, similar to how Nadie Yeter did in the 2018 PS4 game and its spin-off scene. As for the supporting cast, I was surprised how well all of these mostly live-action actors like Nicolas Cage, Haile Steinfeld, Marcella Ali, and others were directed to actually sound like they were doing good vocal performances and didn't come across like they were just reading their lines like how it was done in the 2004's PlayStation 2 Spider-Man 2 movie tie-in game. I can clearly recognize how Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse was a true labor of love made by its three directors Bob Persichetti, Peter Ramsey and Rodney Rothman, with Phil Lord as the co-screenwriter with Rothman. The movie
movie ended up winning an Oscar for the best animated feature and made back its budget four times at the box office. So naturally it's already getting two sequels that, that I seriously hope are organic and natural continuations instead of studio mandated sequels that banked on recreating the original success. Yeah, I know we had the Spider-Man 2099 in the post credit scene voiced by Oscar Isaac. So that wasn't a joke, but rather a fully cast in sequel piece. Regardless, these are my thoughts on Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which I cannot believe it took me over four years to sit down and watch. Now it's time for me to stop this video from becoming too long and let you viewers express yourselves on how well I managed to review this movie. That means like the video, comment whatever you have in mind about what I said about it, share this video for more people to see, and subscribe for other videos I will have coming in the future. Also, ding the bell to be alerted for gameplay streams where I get footage from video game recap reviews, and may your heart be your guiding key.